Good evening. Uh, my talk this morning is called A Healer's Odyssey. I feel like I'm two different people. One self gets up in the morning, acts out the part of spiritual healer in something called the body. Another self goes to sleep at night, travels to distant galaxies, visits with the rich and famous. There's all kinds of neat things in something called a dream. Now, because of this description at the first National Healers Conference in Asheville, North Carolina, way back in 1991, a man in a brown suit walked up to me and put a piece of paper in my hand with six words on it. Those six words really summarize my life quite well today. What it said was, he who walks on two worlds. Now, as a little side note, the best clairvoyant I've ever met in my life is my friend in Scottsdale, Ann Perrier. And about a year before I wrote my book on dreams, I visited her and I said, Ann, could you give me a title for my book? And she said, write the book, the title will come. <laughs> I said, thank you very much. You know, that helps a lot. So I'm looking at this piece of paper, he who walks on two worlds. And I said, yeah, that's real catchy. That'd make a good title for a dream book. And then I asked the people around me on stage, who was the man in the brown suit who just walked up to me? And everybody on stage swore nobody on the brown suit had walked up to me. Wow. So I didn't know what to make of that, but I remember Ann saying, write the book, the title will come, and I saved the piece of paper. Now, during my early years back in Brooklyn, New York, I think I walked on neither world. Because back in those early days, I grew up in a ghetto in Brownsville section of Brooklyn. There was a lot of anger. There was a lot of fear. I was constantly running from gangs. Uh, so by the time I reached age 20, I used to call myself an advanced atheist. What's an advanced atheist? That's a person who thinks he doesn't believe in God, but he also wants to argue with everybody who says that they do. <laughs> well, fortunately for me, God had plans for me. And on one cold November evening in 1967, I got on my motorcycle from my 30-minute ride home from Brooklyn College. Five minutes from my parents' house, all of a sudden there was a steel wall right in front of me. And before I could avoid it, I crashed into a disabled trailer truck that had been abandoned on the highway in the passing lane, no lights on. Now, I didn't black out and go into a tunnel and see the light. Instead, I found myself in the street, bleeding profusely, and in a lot of pain. Strangely enough, I didn't have any fear at the time. All I could think of is my life is meaningless. Let's just get it over with. I think that's when Spirit looked down and said, I think we need to teach the boy what it's all about. So an ambulance came, took me to a big city emergency room. I lay on a gurney for another three hours until they were ready for me. Finally, the doctors came in, they did some suturing, they ran some tests. Then at 3 a.m. in the morning, they came back into the room and said, okay, all the bleeding has stopped. You don't have any major injuries. Here's a pair of crutches. You can go. So as I limped out of the hospital, I said, things are going to be different. I felt like my life had been given back to me. And I thought nothing was ever going to be the same again. Even though I was injured and they said I'd never run track again, I didn't believe it. I decided I didn't want to live in New York City anymore. So I rode away for a track scholarship to the South. Now I was accepted both in Florida and in Louisiana. I had a lot of relatives in Florida. I had none in Louisiana. I chose Louisiana. I knew that I had to get away from my family to become who I needed to be. Uh, well, I got to Louisiana, I was limping and the track coach looked at me and said, well, what's this? And I said, not to worry. For some reason, I had absolute faith that I was gonna heal completely. Well, within six weeks of getting there, I was running as fast as I had ever run. A few months after that, I'm at the YMCA lifting weights, and a man walks up to me and says, wow, you're really strong. He said, you should enter this upcoming weightlifting contest. You could win a trophy. And I said, well, I don't think I can do that. I said, I just run with my legs and I lift with the upper body. And he said, well, if you run with your legs, you can lift with your legs wrong, totally different type of musculature. So at my first weightlifting contest, doing what's called a deadlift, I wrenched my low back. Now my sister is a nurse in New York City. Her husband's an internist in New York City. I called them and I said, okay, I hurt my back, what should I do? And they both said, go see an orthopedic surgeon. 
And I said, okay, this is my family. They love me. That must be the perfect answer. So I go to the orthopedic surgeon. He x-rays me and says, well, there's no structural damage. Take this pill, this pill, and this pill. <laughs> Muscle relaxers, anti-inflammatory, and pain medication. The symptoms persisted. For the next three years, right into graduate school, I had the low back discomfort. Finally, a, a friend of mine said, you know, I'm tired of you complaining about your back. I'm going to take you to my chiropractor. He's going to fix it. Well, I didn't want to go to the chiropractor. Number one, I heard this rumor that they cracked your back. And I said, well, why do I want someone to crack my back if it's already hurting? But this guy was very determined, so I followed along, goes to this chiropractor. He examines me and says, aha, your spine has been hurting because it's out of line. To myself, I said, no way. This guy finds it like this, and two medical specialists couldn't find it. My orthopedic surgeon and my brother-in-law is an internist. To myself, I said, okay, I'll let the guy treat me that day, but I'm not going to go back because it couldn't be that simple. Next morning, I wake up, and my back felt a lot better. And I thought, can this be real? Well, the only way to be certain is to go back again. Each time I went back, it got a little bit better, a little bit better. By the end of the month, the pain I had for three years was gone. And I said, I think I need to become a chiropractor. Well, knowing how my family was going to react, because I'd already changed majors five times, <laughs> I said, I better go to the oldest chiropractic school, which was Palmer. So off to Iowa I go, still calling myself an advanced atheist. One day a classmate tells me he's going to go to a workshop to hear a psychic speak. And what did I say? I said, if you're that gullible, I better go with you to protect you. Because I thought that was nonsense. Well, instead of protecting my friend, I started sensing something which I couldn't explain. So for the next three years, I kept on looking for answers. How is this possible? I didn't even believe in it. Finally, in 1975, I went into a bookstore in Davenport, Iowa, and the word ESP caught my eye. And I thought, okay, maybe that book has an answer for me. And I took the book off the shelf, and I opened it up, and the page I turned to, someone was ill, and they said they needed some chiropractic care. I said, okay, that sounds good. I was a senior then in chiropractic school. It also said that nutrition was important. I said, okay, nutrition's important. Then it said attitudes and emotions are important. Okay, attitudes and emotions are important. What I was looking at was something called a reading because the book was Edgar Cayce on ESP. So what I tell people, that's the hook that caught this fish. That put a crack in the door of spiritual disbelief. But next I picked up the biography of Edgar Cayce, There is a River. And what the first book started, the second book, kicked the door wide open. It was like someone had turned on a light bulb inside my brain. And all of a sudden, all the mystery of growing up poor in a ghetto with all that violence, all, a lot of it became very clear to me. So I joined the ARE, the Association of Research and Enlightenment, the Edgar Casey Foundation. And I started studying my dreams. I've recorded over 16,000 dreams since I started in 1975 in June. And a lot of my guidance has come through the dreams. Now, the ARE used to have holistic health conferences in Phoenix, Arizona every year, and I started going. So what I'm going to, let me back up here, back after sensing the energy fields. Uh, I wasn't sure, you know, what to make of that. Uh, I still didn't think of myself as a spiritual healer. You know, to me, it was just some strange thing that I was sensing something around people. Actually, at the time, I didn't really call it energy fields. Anyway, so I go to the 1977 uh, Holistic Health Conference with uh, the ARE in Phoenix. I show up there a day early. Uh, I'm walking in the lobby. A woman walks up to me and taps me on the shoulder and says, we need to talk. And I say, okay, I didn't know who she was. And she said, what do you think you're doing? And I said, I don't, what do you mean, what am I doing? The muscles are moving my hands. And she said, uh, no, you're sensing energy fields. And of course, I didn't have a clue what she was talking about. Uh, but see, when I first was in chiropractic school, I went to this seminar, and this man came back to school six months after that and explained to me what had happened. Initially, I couldn't sense anything. 
And he said, okay, I want you to put your hands in this person's back and focus in on them with your hands on them and ask, show me a no, and then show me a yes. So when I put my hands on the person's spine and I asked, show me a no, it was nothing. And then when I said, show me a yes, my hands moved. Now, I was very much a doubting Thomas. I must have asked 30 times. Show me a no, show me a yes. Show me a no, show me a yes. Are you sure? It was just so hard for me to believe. So meeting this woman, and some, for those of you who might recognize the name, the woman's name was Rosalind Bruyere, very famous healer in Southern California. She was going to be the keynote speaker at the conference that week. Everybody was dying to get a hold of her for just a minute. I have a three-hour discussion with her. So it seems like a lot of people uh, that I've needed to help with my growth have shown up at the right time over the last 25 years. So what I do in the workshop is I'm gonna tell my story chronologically as I work on some volunteers' spines. The reason I'm gonna work on the spine, 95 out of 100 people and their spine has misalignment, they lay face down with their shoes on, one leg is gonna be shorter. 95 out of 100 people in the chiropractor aligns their spine, the legs usually even out. Also, I'm gonna work on the spine, but I'm gonna share a lot of cases, letting you know that with spiritual healing, you can work with all things, because if you're a spiritual healer, who's doing the work? God's doing the work. You're just a neutral conduit. But initially, I'm not gonna tell you what I'm doing until we reach that point chronologically. Because over the years, people said it really helped them on their own spiritual journey for me to share my story, step by step by step, but initially not tell you what I'm doing as I do the healing, until we reach that point chronologically. So I have time to usually work on about 10 people. So let me have a show of hands. Who'd wanna be those 10 volunteers? <laughs> okay. okay, so I wanna tell my story step by step. So when these people come up, I'm just gonna get there. Actually, I'm gonna have them tell me their name rather than uh, say it out loud. So uh, let me have number one. Each card has a number on it. Let me have you come on up here. I have you on your stomach. Okay. Now, I mentioned initially when I got involved with this, I, would, I did it by putting my hands on the person. Uh, so I want to show you how that first happened in chiropractic school. And this was before I even knew I was sensing energy fields. So I would put my hands on the person's back and I would think at them, show me a no show me a yes, show me a no, show me a yes. So I thought the muscles were moving my hands when I was getting a yes response. Then I would ask questions like your spine, is it in line, it's out? The neck, is it in, it's out, is it the oxford? C1, any of cervical? So C1 in the upper neck. Mid back, anything, low back, L1, 2, 3, 4, L5, SI. So up here, say a fifth lumbar, sacroiliac. Now, what did I mention? That when people have misalignment, they lay face down with their shoes on, 95 out of 100 people will have one leg shorter. So when we check him, right now the right leg, for those in the back who can't see, is about a third of an inch shorter. I'm not gonna explain what I'm doing right now, but I'm gonna do some healing. Okay, for those in the back who can't see, his legs are even now, you can get back up. Now, a lot of times I would wear a hug therapist button, so if I work on you and you're comfortable, you can give me a hug. Oh. <laughs> Thanks a lot, I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. About 50% of the people I work with when I'm doing the healing and God's working through me will sense something at the time. Things like heat, tingling, a sense of peace, a sense of love, 
a wave sensation traveling over the body, 50% won't sense anything at the time. But usually about 90% will notice in that first 24 hours after the healing that the symptoms are diminished or gone. So whatever the person is allowing themselves to receive will usually manifest very, very fast. Okay, so I told you at my first holistic health conference, I met Rosalind Breuer. And Rosalind said, what do you think you're doing when you put your hands on people? And of course, I thought, well, the muscles were moving my hands. And she said, no, you're sensing energy fields. And she said, you don't need contact. And of course, what did I say to her? I don't have a clue what you're talking about. So let me have number two. Okay, look in the stomach. Okay, so after meeting Rosalind, she said, just focus at the body. Show me a no, show me a yes. Show me a no, show me a yes. So what it feels like, have you ever as a child put your hand on a stream of, uh, at a river? Let your hand flow with the current. That's what a yes response feels like to me. The no response, no sensation. So once again, I'm just gonna diagnose the spine. Your spine, is it in, it's out? The neck, is it in, out? Is it the occiput, C1, C2, C3, any other cervical? Mid-back, is it in, out? Okay. Mid-back, T1, T2, any other mid-back? Low back, L1, 2, 3, 4, L5, SI. Okay, so in her case, something in the neck, something between the shoulders, fifth lumbar, sacroiliac. Once again, we'll just check the legs. In her case, right leg may be an inch shorter. I always like to tell stories uh, of things that I've encountered along the way. I once saw a flyer announcing God's chiropractor was going to speak at this church. And I said, I want to check this out. I want to see who God's chiropractor is. So I went to this Pentecostal church, and there was a traveling evangelist who would pray over people, and their legs got even. I thought, well, that's great. He's got the gift of healing. The problem was he thought it should be 100%. And a few of them were like this at the end, and he said, yep, you're even. So what I tell people with spiritual healing, call it the way you see it. You don't know enough to tell the Holy Spirit what the answer should be. So there's two variables, and I'm going to explain those two in just a minute after I balance her here. So once again, I'm going to do some healing, and I'm not going to tell you what I'm doing until we reach that point chronologically. Okay, looks good. You can get back up. Yeah, I've seen it as much as a two inch difference even out. And I still blink when I see that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I'm also gonna be asking people like of the volunteers, but at the end I'm gonna do a group healing also. So if anybody has something they wanna share, like they felt uh, some sensation or they had a pain and all of a sudden they realize it's diminished or gone, because this tends to happen very frequent. Uh, I was very glad on Sunday at the, the workshop at the church, a lot of people at the end were sharing how things were changing. Because I never know what any particular audience, I'm not in charge. Uh, you know, when you make up triangle of God, spiritual healer and individual, God wants everybody to have an abundant life. The spiritual healer by definition is neutral. So by definition, it's always the person who can receive fully, partially, or choose not to receive. I'm not in charge. And that's why it's very humbling. I don't know what's gonna happen. It may be something slight. It may be something dramatic. It may be someone with an attached retina and all of a sudden sees perfectly, or someone's diabetes overnight, it's just normal. Or nobody might say anything for six months and then all of a sudden they said, you know, I really did feel better. So I never know. But the first variable with spiritual healing is preconceived concepts preconceived concepts tend to get in the way. 
Now, I was trained as a chiropractor. But what if I see a man limp into a room like this? What's my first preconceived concept? That he has sciatic problems? That he has a hip problem or low back problem? Or maybe he just stepped on a piece of glass? Or maybe if it's a man, his underwear is too tight. <laughs> you know, we have to look at it like we were a little child who has never seen that before. So one of the things I use for myself to get neutral is what I call as a mental smack. So it's like saying, okay, get neutral, get neutral, clear, 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 get neutral, clear. I want to get to that neutral space, put all my medical knowledge off to the side so it doesn't get in the way. I don't share this case to shock audiences, but it's just so important to stay neutral. It was about 17 years ago in Florida, a lady minister came to me and she said, Dr. Shea, I want you to give me a sexual healing. And I said, hold on a second. <laughs> I said, okay, I'm ready. She said, yeah, I want you to help me have an orgasm. I said, hold on a second. <laughs> Took a lot of slapping. <laughs> Finally felt neutral, did the healing. The next day her husband came in and said, that was great. <laughs> About a week later, I'm working with his elderly cup and I share this case and uh, the man goes, oh, I sure could use some healing down there. And I said, hold on a second. And I said, can we do that? See, initially I didn't know what I could do or what I couldn't do. And I got yes, worked on him. Four days later, his wife comes back in and says, is it possible to give someone too much healing? <laughs> Now, people think I make some of these stories up. Believe me, spirit will give you examples you would have never imagined on your own. Another year, I lectured in Franklin, North Carolina, and a 76-year-old man came to see me who had prostate surgery. Ever since the surgery, there was no sexual function. He asked for some healing. I worked with him. That was in November. I got a Christmas card from him that year, and in the card they wrote, just wanted you to know everything is working again. So why do I share these things? It's to let people know that with spiritual healing, nothing is too trivial to ask God for help. Now, yes, sometimes I may have to change the wording. So if a person says, yeah, I want some healing for wrinkles. No, but I can do some healing for skin. Wrinkles implies God straighten it out. You can't give God orders. Or say a woman says, I want some healing to lose 30 pounds, make me 36, 22. I said, no, no, no. I can do some healing to assist you to your ideal weight or relationships. It's not saying, uh, make my ex miserable and make me happy. No, we can put the relationship in God's hands, highest and best for all concern. So you, you got to stay neutral, not give God directions, and it's always win-win. Okay, so 1977, I meet Rosalind Bruyere. She shows me how I'm sensing energy fields. But at the time, I had a traditional chiropractic clinic in Monroe, Louisiana. Now, do you think I went back to my clinic in Monroe, Louisiana and said to my patients, you know, I don't longer need to check your spine physically because I could read your energy fields. I didn't think they were ready to hear that. So uh, what I did is the game I played is people came in, they got on the table, I would go and palpate the spine and I'd write something down and I'd palpate the spine, and I'd write something down. And that's what I did with everybody, except once. I forgot. A lady comes in, she gets up on the table. I went up to my notes. And I looked up and she was staring at me. <laughs> and all I could think of at the time was, uh. My wrist really hurt today. She didn't buy that explanation. So for the next eight years, whenever she would come in, she'd always be, now why did I care? All health professionals in the United States are subject to the same thing. It's called consensus medicine. You're supposed to be doing what everybody else is doing who's licensed by the state to practice that specialty. So my concern at the time was what if the state board hears about this, calls me up and says, Dr. Shea, what's this? Where'd you learn that? So to protect myself, I started reading energy fields with my hands at my side. In other words, instead of saying, show me a no, show me a yes, 
I would do it at my side saying, show me a no, show me a yes. Show me a no, show me a yes. So I can get the same response, it's not as noticeable. I only had to put up with a slight rumor, which was that I had developed a twitch, <laughs> but it was so slight, no one ever questioned you know, what it was about. Now, once my family, uh, people say, well, what did your family think about this? Well, one family get together, so to summarize my whole family, at the family get together, my niece climbed up on a chair and she was about four, and she said, okay, everybody, who am I? <laughs> well, that was Uncle Saul, and uh, that's what the family thought about me for about 20 years, up until about four years ago. Something happened four years ago that dramatically changed how the family was looking at the healing work that I do. And what happened four years ago is the Green Bay Packers called me up for the first time. So we'll just pass those around. I've now worked with over 60 players in the NFL and over 15 coaches. And all of a sudden it became real, especially when they saw me on a Monday night game on the sideline because I told them I'd wear a white shirt with a black sleeveless vest. You know, I couldn't wear pink, it'd be too noticeable. But they did spot me on one of the side uh, lines of the, uh, the game. So I asked my family, well, what did you think I've been doing all these years? And they said, well, I don't know, uh, reading tea leaves? It's amazing, people don't understand you know, new thought. You tell them you're doing spiritual healing, they don't have a clue a lot of times what you're doing. And they put everything, new thought, in one big grab bag, but all of a sudden it became real. Okay, you're working with these famous athletes. So okay, that was 1977. 1979, I go to a small holistic health conference in Maui, and I meet a famous nutritionist, medical doctor, dentist, Dr. Sharaskin. And we became friends. He was very taken with the fact that I could tune into the body and get information. And he said, you know, why don't you come back to the Mandala Conference in San Diego the following summer? He said about 3,000 people attend. And if you come back, he said, I'll introduce you. We'll have a lot of fun. So I did come back the following summer. He introduced me to a lot of people, and I'm working on them. Let me tell you how I'm working on them. I was diagnosing their spine, but then I was physically adjusting the spine. Now, sometimes an event occurs that on the surface seems to be a negative event, but it's not a negative event if it acts as a springboard to the next stage. So at the conference, three chiropractors put in a complaint to the uh, California Board of Chiropractic Examiners. The state representative shows up and says, Dr. Shea, please stop physically adjusting people's spines as you're only licensed in Louisiana and not California. Now, the president of the conference, David Harris, he was ready to fight. And I said, look, let's not fight. There's a reason. I just don't know what it is. So I get back to my clinic in Louisiana, and I go, OK, what's the problem? They didn't care that I could diagnose without touching. They just didn't want me physically manipulating the spine. So I'm in my clinic, and I say, hmm, too bad I couldn't do it without touching. But then they wouldn't have had a problem. And as soon as I had that thought, I felt the urge to throw an adjustment. And I thought, throw an adjustment, what's that gonna do? Well, a lady comes in and I go, uh, you know if I do an experiment? And she said, fine. I had her get on the table. I checked her out, checked her legs, did not treat her. Went back into my office about 30 feet away. And based on how she was out of alignment, I threw an adjustment at her. Came back into the room and before I said anything, she said, what did you just do? And I said, well, why do you ask? And she said, well, she came in with her shoulder hurting. And after I left the room, the shoulder stopped hurting. And when I checked her, she was already lined up. Something had been presented. A lot of times when I do my holistic health lecture uh, in part one, I share certain things in that. And one of them is that I was a competitive bodybuilder for many, many years. And uh, in 1979, I placed fourth in Mr. Louisiana, but on a day when I shouldn't have. There were four men in the audience that day who could have beaten me who didn't want to compete that day. So I took the trophy and I said, God, thank you for the trophy. It's enough. I then cut back my workout, so now it's just for fun and for health. A few weeks after that, I had a dream in which a teacher said, now that you put competition behind you, we can get on and do some important work with your life. So I think when this unfolded that following year, it was because I had released the sports competition. Not that I think sports competition is a problem. I think for me, I was addicted to it. 
and it was preventing me from receiving my highest spiritual good. Let me have number three. Okay, Suzanne Hendrick. H-E-N-T-R-I-C-H. Okay, I'm going to have you on your stomach. Okay, so Suzanne, your spine, is it in? It's out. The neck, is it in? It's out. Is it the occiput? C1, C2, any other cervical? C2. Mid back, is it in, out, T1, T2, T3, any other mid back? T3. Lumbar, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, SI. Okay, so in our case, four spots. Like I said, for those in the back, you not be able to see this, but really I'm just sharing my journey because I want to eventually show you how with spiritual healing you work with all things. So I'm working on the spine, but the bottom line is people get results and not just for their legs becoming even. Right now, her right leg is about a half inch shorter. So I want to show you how I first threw an adjustment. It's going to look a little bit weird but I want you to go through the same journey I went through step by step by step. So this is for the low back. And this is for the mid back. And this is for the neck. I know that looks kind of weird. Okay, your spine, anything more? No. Okay, looks good. You can get back up. No, okay. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so let me share with you also what I think is the spiritual model versus the medical model. I think the spiritual model looks at the body like everything is a little energy system. Organs, glands, muscles, nerves. These are all little energy systems just like a battery. And just like a battery, it's either fully charged or it's not fully charged. And when it's not fully charged, there might be an irritation, there might be a manifestation. A doctor may want to call it something like arthritis, diabetes, macular degeneration, subluxation, depression. Spirit doesn't call it anything. Spirit just says the batteries are not fully charged. Well, what gets the batteries not fully charged? Stress, strain, fatigue, diet, injuries, attitudes, emotions, heredity, karma, lots of things. And that's why I lecture on holistic health to tell people, take charge of your life. Let me give you a little story about karma. About half the work I do is over the phone. So a lady calls for some healing and a little child keeps on interrupting, saying, ask, ask, ask. And the mom says, but you were born that way. But the child had the perfect statement, just ask. Perfect statement. What the child was asking is he was born with a birthmark that covered 95% of his face and children would make fun of him at school. And he was asking if I could do some healing to make it go away. So I worked with the child. I heard back from the parents about six months later that 90% of the face had cleared. And people would ask me, how can that be? It's heredity, it's karma. Simple rule with spiritual healing. Grace wipes out karma. The challenge for the spiritual healer is to stay neutral. Remember when Jesus did healing, he didn't say, uh, what did you have for breakfast? Did you love your parents? No, spiritual healing is unconditional. So when people came up to Jesus and they said, I want to walk, you got it. Someone else said, well, uh, I want to see, you got it. And the only thing he told people that we know of, he said, go and sin no more, meaning change your thoughts, change your actions, don't duplicate the problem. But spiritual healing is unconditional. And that's why I say, you know, if you have the gift of healing, you got to release the preconceived concept and the answer. Okay, so 1981, I'm dating a woman in Monroe, Louisiana, and she comes walking up to me with a book in her hand and a frown on her face. And she said, I just read this book and I didn't like it, but you probably will. <laughs> and she was right, I read the book and I loved the book. The book was The Magic of Findhorn. 
Fintorn is this spiritual community in Northern Scotland that has a dramatic story of how it came into being. Eileen Caddy would go into meditation, hear the Holy Spirit speak to her, and that went on nightly for almost 40 years. Uh, another woman, Dorothy McLean, would be able to grow vegetables larger and faster. And a third person, a man named Abercrombie, would be able to see and communicate with the nature spirits. So I read the book and I go, well, it's a wonderful story, but there's no way this is real. You know, this is 1981. These things just don't happen. Well, everywhere I went that year, people kept on mentioning Findhorn. I finally made a very dangerous statement. I said, if another person mentions Findhorn, I'm going there. <laughs> so I go to the Mandala Conference in San Diego that year, and David Harris says, Saul, did I introduce you to my wife, Anastas? You know, we were married at Findhorn. <laughs> and I said, okay, God, you, you want me to go to Scotland? I had to get on the phone and say, okay, where is this place? You know, if you want to go to Findhorn, you've got to make the effort to go to Findhorn. You've got to fly into London, England, then you fly either into Edinburgh or Inverness, Scotland, then you take a train to the little town of Forest, then you take a taxi to the Findhorn Foundation. So on the train from Edinburgh, I was having these preconceived thoughts going through my head. It was like Alan Cohen's book, The Dragon Doesn't Live Here Anymore. He was talking about a man sitting on a large rock by a river in India, eating an artichoke. And all of a sudden it comes to him, the meaning of life, and how he as his soul was letting God work through him to help others. And he goes to the village to share what he had learned. And they said, well, how did you learn this? And he said, well, I don't, I don't know. I was sitting on the big rock by the river eating an artichoke when it came to me. So he goes to sleep. The next morning he wakes up. The whole village is empty. He goes down to the river. And the whole village is sitting on that big rock eating an artichoke. <laughs> People think if they get those same external things, they're going to get the same reaction. So what was I thinking? I'm going to Findhorn. God's going to speak to me. Why? Well, he speaks to Eileen Caddy. Maybe, maybe God talks up there. Or the vegetables are going to talk to me. You know, they talk to Dorothy and McLean. Maybe, maybe they're chatty up there. Uh, and if not, I'm going to see the nature spirits in the gardens. So I get to Clooney Hill College. And that's their main facility. And the first person I see walking in the dining room is Eileen Caddy. You know, I recognized her from her photo. And I had all these questions I wanted to ask her. You know, what's it like talking to God nightly and getting answers? I talked myself out of it. I basically said, look, you just got here. She doesn't know you. She looks like a nice person. Sit down, mind your own business. Well, simple rule. If it's supposed to happen, it happens. So I sit down at the dining room table by myself. Uh, a lady comes up and says, well, if you have the whole table, I'll keep you company. Two minutes later, Peter Caddy comes up to the table and invites this woman to the head table. She was a writer. They wanted to ask her something. Two minutes later, Peter Caddy comes back and says, Eileen said we should bring the woman's boyfriend with her. <laughs> so they bring me up to the head table, sit me down right next to Eileen Caddy, and she says, so what do you do? And I said, well, I'm a chiropractor, but I can see by your energy field that you're out of alignment. And she said, great. Would you be willing to do a workshop on that while you're here? And I said, sure. That was the first talk I ever gave on spiritual healing. And because they liked the way it went, I did it there 11 times during the 1980s. Now, we had an expression at Fintorn that as the week went by, everybody got prettier. Because in that setting, there was a lot of soul recognition. So by the end of the week, People had become like family. And I was a little bit depressed. I didn't want to say goodbye to people who'd become like family. I was also a little bit depressed because I thought nothing had happened. I must have gone to their sanctuary, their meditation room, six times a day. What was I doing there six times a day? God. <laughs> I got to admit, I did not hear a voice talk to me, but it was the most amazing silence I've ever felt. There's something about a room that's had numerous people meditate and pray for years. It creates this very nurturing vortex. So I thought, okay, well, maybe, maybe the vegetables will talk to me. You know, I never grew anything. I don't know. What do you ask, a, you know, a cabbage? So I went into the garden. I said, you want water? You, know, you want fertilizer? I don't even know what fertilizer is. But they weren't talking to me. Someone else said, if you go into the gardens at twilight and squint, you can see the nature spirits. So, of course, I went out there at twilight and 
nothing. So I thought nothing happened. Another expression about fin tone is whereas people used to go to see the giant vegetables they grew, now people go and people are transformed. I got back to Louisiana, I had two wonderful dreams on spiritual healing. First one, I'm in a church, I come out of the church and there's a gate with a lock on it. And I say, okay, lock, I made the sign of the cross and said in the name of the Christ, and the lock opened. And a voice said, look at that, we have Christ in our midst. And I said, no, I'm no one. I'm here to help him manifest the Christ. Thought it was a great dream, didn't know what to do with it. I'm at a Nairi conference uh, in Phoenix. We're discussing dreams, I mentioned this dream. And a woman says, well, you're a chiropractor, why don't you make the sign of the cross over someone's spine and see what will happen? So what did I say? Oh, nothing's gonna happen, it's just a dream. And she said, humor me. Uh, let me have number four. Stuart, Oh, I see, Stuart, Stuart, okay. G-E-L-T. G-E-L-T. Okay. We can just put that. Okay. Whatever. And I'm always thinking of examples that I say, Holy Spirit, give me an example I need for this group. So I was thinking of this case. Uh, I saw a medical doctor in Florida who was addicted to cocaine. She said she was embarrassed to tell me she had this addiction, but she knew that if she didn't share where she was stuck, she wouldn't receive fully. And when I see people one-on-one, -on -one, I say, look, pick your top three things. The simpler you describe it, the better, but then I check everything. And she wrote me back about six months later. She said, it was very interesting. She said, you know what the medical model is with recovery and withdrawal? But she said there was no withdrawal. It was like someone had turned the switch to off. The craving was just gone. And that's happened a number of times with different addictions that people have written back to me. Uh, once uh, with alcohol, a number of times with tobacco. They said it, was, no, it wasn't a gradual withdrawal, it was just no more craving. The spiritual model is very, very different. It's like recharging the battery. And if the person is receptive and it's recharged totally, it very, very fast. Uh, just like, you know, when the woman touched the hem of Jesus' garment, she didn't say, can I hold on for an hour? She touched it. It happened. Okay, so when I make the sign of the cross, I'm saying in the name of the Christ. Now, I no longer need to check individual segments. Why was I checking individual segments? I thought I had to show God how a chiropractor would adjust the spine. <laughs> can we show spirit anything? No. Spirit knows so much more than we could ever know, but I had to learn that step by step, and that was my next step, getting out of the way. So your spine, is it in? It's out? Can I work with it? Okay, so right leg, maybe about a quarter of an inch. Okay, so when I make the sign of the cross, I'm saying in the name of the Christ, in the name of the Christ, in the name of the Christ, in the name of the Christ. Your spine, anything more? Okay, looks good. You can get back up. And if you're comfortable, you can give me a hug. What? If you're comfortable. I'm comfortable. Thank you. Thank you. Good. <laughs> uh, second dream after Fintorn. Initially, I didn't feel comfortable in telling people about it because I thought people would get the wrong concept. The more I thought about it, I said, you know, that's not a bad dream. In the second dream on healing, I'm in a conflict situation with two people with guns. And as soon as I get around one of them, the other one gets behind me. And I finally say, there's no way I can deal with this on my own. I'm gonna have to come forth and state who I am. The answer was, I am Christ. And with that, the conflict was removed. Now I interpret that dream to be saying, we all make up the body of Christ. And until we acknowledge our true identity, conflict seems to remain in our life. Once again, I thought it was a great dream, but once again, I didn't know what to do with it. Once again, I'm at an ARE conference. Once again, they're discussing dreams. 
I mentioned this dream. Once again, it's a woman. I think women have more intuition on these things. And the woman said, well, why don't you do the healing with the I am? And I said, well, what's that? And she said, well, that's the way God spoke to Moses. I am that I am. So what did I say? Oh, that won't work. See, I got to use the sign of the cross. She said, humor me. Uh, let me have number five. Okay. Now, in my clinic, I was doing spiritual healing as a hobby. I actually never thought I was going to close my clinic. I had a nice big practice. It was safe. It was secure. Actually, one day I realized I'm playing it safe. I'm a spiritual be being playing it safe. Why am I doing that? You know, as spiritual beings, we came here to grow. But while I had my clinic and I was doing spiritual healing as a hobby, I felt very vulnerable using the sign of the cross because it was very outward. And I thought, well, what, what if someone comes into the room and sees me doing this? You know, state boards don't like seeing any doctors doing anything looking religious in their clinics. So I thought, okay, if the I am is another way of doing the healing, maybe I can do it in such a way that even if you saw me do it, you wouldn't know what you were seeing. So that's what I'm going to show you here with George. Okay, so your spine, is it in? It's out? Can I work with it? Now, you hear me say, can I work with it? People have asked me, did you ever get a no? Yes, but it's been very rare. And the first time I got a no, I said, what do you mean no? <laughs> person wants healing. <laughs> See, like every time I've come to a door, I've been given the guidance on how to go around the door. So that first time that happened and I got no, I said, okay, let me try an experiment. I stepped off by myself and I said the following prayer. Father God, not by my will but thine, be done in and through me for that which is the highest and best for all concern. When I rechecked, I got, go ahead and do the healing. I told that to the woman. She said, that's interesting. It was basically the same prayer she had. Prayer helps to remove obstacles. So people might say, look, I have a brother. He's not open to healing. Pray for him. It might gradually make him more receptive. Now, one of the reasons I need permission and awareness to work on people, it's based on an Edgar Cayce statement, to heal the body physical without an awareness of the body spiritual is to save the body for destruction in materiality. And what it's saying is it's for your highest spiritual growth for you to make a conscious connection to God. So if you're conscious, I need permission that it's okay to do the healing and you know when. So say someone says, well, I'd like you to work my eight-year-old son. And they go up to the eight-year-old son and says, is it okay if we pray for you tomorrow night at eight o'clock? And this child says, yes, that's permission and awareness. Okay, so right now to start, right leg looks about a third of an inch shorter. Okay, so, of course, in my clinic, if I would do the healing with the I am, I wouldn't say it out loud, but I'm going to say it out loud to show you what I was doing in my clinic. I am. I am. I am. I am. Your spine. Anything more to spine? Okay. Looks good. You can get back up. Okay. And if you're comfortable. Uh, I gave out a number of handouts. I didn't have enough for the whole audience, but one of the handouts said healing hands that don't touch. And it mentions uh, speaking at the Festival of Mind, Body, Spirit in London, England in 1984. And it's an article about a, a med not a medical doctor, a chiropractor who brought his wife to the workshop who was blind. And in the article it says, I worked on her, she felt heat, regained her sight, 
Then he studied with me, and now he does it in his clinic there in England. Now, everything in that article is true, except he didn't study with me. See, I can't give anybody the gift of spiritual healing. I didn't give him the gift of spiritual healing. He already had the gift of spiritual healing. It's my belief that when you share your gift to the best of your awareness, you help others bring their gift more to the surface. What was also interesting is I never worked on the woman's eyes. She was one of the volunteers that I worked on her spine. Remember that triangle I showed you back at the start? God, the spiritual healer, and the individual. God wants everybody to have abundant life. The spiritual healer, by definition, is neutral. It's always the person who can receive fully, partially, or choose not to receive. Now, the woman who was on the table with me just balancing her spine chose to receive healing for her sight and started seeing. Well, like I said, when I got that, I said, wow, that's really cool, you know, because I knew I didn't do that. Uh, next week, I'm going to be speaking in Eugene and the church administrator. Uh, I worked on her dog 10 years ago. Uh, she brought the dog to me at age one. It was born with a deformed heart. And she had to see a specialist every six weeks up in Portland. Anyway, I worked on the dog, and six weeks later, she called me and said she went back to the same specialist, and the heart was completely normal. And actually, it's been normal ever since. And people said, how did you fix that heart? What's the answer? I didn't. I don't know how to fix a heart. What I know how to check is energy fields. To me, it wasn't like a leaking valve, and I figured out how to suture it back. It was checking the energy systems. To me, a heart is an energy system, the immune system, the lymphatic system, the chemistry, the blood, the circulation. And I ask, is it full, not full? If it's not fully charged, it's like I'm plugging it in. It's like the person, the animal. It's like they're an appliance. The plugs come loose to the source, which is guard, God. And I'm just making the connection. I don't know how to fix these things. And that's what I tell spiritual healers. Don't take it personal. A lot of spiritual healers, you know, want to help so much that they're taking on a lot of what they're trying to help people with and they start getting ill. You've got to stay neutral. And I think it's one of the reasons why I have more energy now at 60 than I did when I was 45. It's just learning how to get out of the way. Don't take things personal. Even if you're seeing 40 people a day, no matter if they have cancer and stroke and depression and all kinds of problems, it's not your challenge. It's God's challenge. Your role as a spiritual healer is just to make the connection for them. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so let's see. I told about Findhorn. I told about the dreams. Okay, man I met at Findhorn in 81 and 82. When I first met him, all he told me was he worked with computers. 1982, when I met him the second time, he uh, shared a lot of things that he was very clairvoyant. He sees a lot of things. He shared a lot of that with me. Ever since then, he showed up in a lot of dreams. 1989, he showed up in a dream, and in the dream, I'm doing some healing, in it, and it looked like an inverted V with a line crossing each leg. And I thought, okay, that's another one of those healing dreams. I couldn't wait to get to my clinic and try it, because that's what my clinic was, like a laboratory for me. You know, people would come in, get on the table, I'd make certain no one's looking, zap them, recheck them, they'd already be even, and then I'd physically adjust them, because that's what they expected me to do as their chiropractor. So I asked about this new symbol, this inverted V symbol, and I got, it was fine, I did it. Two weeks go by, still getting good results. I'm standing outside the post office there in Monroe, Louisiana, and I'm staring at a building across the street, and the building across the street had a symbol on it like the symbol in the dream, because the building across the street was the Masonic Temple. And if you understand what the symbol on the side of the Masonic Temple is, a compass, which is an inverted V, the right angle ruler which intersects each leg and I'm looking at it and I'm saying a line and a line you connect to get a triangle a line and a line you connect to get another triangle a triangle on top of a triangle gives you the star of David I said I wonder if the star of David would be healing so let's see we're up to number six or oh okay let me get number six Okay, give me this number. I had a woman mid-60s said, too bad you can't do something for hair loss. 
And I said, who says we can't? And she says, well, you can. I said, well, no one had ever asked that before. So I tuned in and got, I had to be very specific, hair growth where? <laughs> and then it was also the scalp and hair follicles. Anyway, she wrote me about six weeks later that the hair started growing in quite thick. I think the only thing limiting people is that they're not, they're not asking. And it's like I always tell people, look, if, if it's meaningful to you, let me just work with you to figure out how to phrase it. Because we can't, it's not a, not a wish list and it's not a Christmas list. And not say, God, give me the boss's job and his M M B uh, BMW. But you can ask for a career healing highest and the best for all concerned. Okay, Solana, your spine, is it in? It's out? Can I work with it? Okay, when I make the Star of David, what I'm saying is the name of the I am, the Father. Can we do that? Okay, let me check the legs. Okay, in her case, right leg, about a half inch. Name of the I am, the Father. Name of the I am of the Father. Name of the I am of the Father. Your spine. Anything more? Done. Okay, looks good. You can get back up. And if you're comfortable, you can give me a hug. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so we get up to this intermission, I'm just going to tell you some uh, different cases. Uh, I had a young 20-year-old in Kingman, Arizona, said, too bad you can't work on cellulite. And I said, who says we can't? And I tuned in and asked, can we? I got yes. Uh, she wrote me back about six months later that about 50% of it was gone. Why wasn't it 100%? Who's in charge? The person's always in charge. And when I try to encourage people, if it can respond some, it can respond completely. Because if it responds some, it shows you are receptive. And remember, God's not holding back. A lot of times people think, well, I don't want to be bothering God. I know he's busy in India with lepers. And <laughs> it's not true. Every single person in the world is precious in God's sight. And people can you know, not only receive part of the healing, they can receive totally. Uh, I know the first time I had a response with diabetes, for some reason, that was one of the longest going conditions without hearing any feedback from people. But then once I got feedback that someone had responded, all of a sudden others started responding. I think it's like the hundredth monkey that we have these belief systems. Oh, that's too complicated. I don't think God can do that. But as soon as one person does, then others start receiving. Uh, how are we doing? Good? Okay. Let's take a break here. Ten minutes. Okay. Good. It, it's hot in here. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna, uh, someone asked me a number of questions during the intermission. I was going to address those. Uh, number one is, you know, what do I use when I'm working on individual people? Because I mentioned the Star of David, I mentioned the sign of the cross, I mentioned the Masonic symbol. Uh, I mentioned my friend in Scottsdale, Ann Perrier. Uh, she was the former spiritual consultant for the ARE clinic because she sees energy fields. Well, I went to go see her in 1989 because I said, Ann, I'm, you know, I'm doing my healing and I don't really know what I'm doing. Could you give me some feedback? So she said, let me watch you work on about 10 people, and then I'll give you some feedback. So I worked on 10 people, and afterwards she said, okay, when you touched them, you had some green light around your hands. She said, okay, that means you have some ability as a healer. But when you got out of the way and let God do the work through you, there was a golden light that came through the crown chakra and exited through the fingers, surround the person and did the healing. She said the vibration was much higher when you got out of the way and let God do the work through you. She said, you'll be able to work faster than anything you know and on things you didn't even know how to work on. Uh, she also said, all three vibrations look the same, this golden light. But if there's any one that I use more than any other, it's the Christ energy. So a lot of times when I work with pets, it's the Christ energy. Uh, financial, it's the Christ energy. A lot of times with dense things like bone or organs, I usually get do it all because I always ask, what should I use? And I trust spirit knows better than me, but you can do it with any one of them. Uh, let me share a dream I had in my dream book. Uh, I was saying in the Christ energy, you could heal anything. And someone said, what do you mean? And I said, let me show you what I mean. There was a crooked road. And I said, in the name of the Christ, and I straightened the road. And I said, that's what I mean. And you can imagine how I felt when I woke up from that dream, like you feel, wow, <laughs> that's powerful. You know, straightening out a rope. But I think of, you know, what Jesus said, if you had 
faith as much as a, a grain of a, a mustard so you could tell this mountain to move. But that was one of those empowering dreams, say everything. Uh, now, when I had my clinic, uh, twice I had seen someone in the 90s who had fractured their hip. And when I looked at the x-ray, it was look, looks like a, a mass of little bones. I couldn't adjust them physically. But I knew that God could adjust them. So in both times I said, you know, let me go look at your x-rays again. And I went out of the room, went into the next room, zapped them through the wall, came back in, rechecked them, and they had evened out. But I couldn't write on Medicare a zapped person back into alignment. <laughs> so I had to give them a reason why they were going to feel better. People need a reason why they're going to respond. So I said, you know, I'm going to do some uh, nimmo acupressure. And maybe we can't get these joints to start shifting so you can get a response and minimize the discomfort. You know, it's unfortunate that in the United States, spiritual healing is not as well received as it is in Great Britain. In Great Britain, 60% of the hospitals have spiritual healers working side by side with the doctors and nurses. Now, why is Great Britain ahead of us? Because many years ago, they wanted to exclude them. But to do that, they had to test them. And when they tested them, it helped so much that they included them. They even have one of their major insurances covers spiritual healing. Wow. Now, I can see that happening in the United States. I mean, insurance people, they just want to lower coverage. So say someone's in a big hospital locally who is diagnosed with needing quadruple bypass. And say the insurance adjuster says, uh, well, before we do anything, I want you to go see that healer who's visiting here, and we'll cover it. I mean, what are they going to be out, $40, $50? But what if they can avoid having a $400,000, $500,000 operation, or maybe there's a death benefit? So I can see it happening with insurance companies. It's still going to be a little bit harder to convince the AMA or the pharmaceuticals, but it's my belief sooner or later they're going to realize we're all in it together and we've got to work together. But I think that's still a long ways off. Uh, sharing different cases, just let people know that you know God is unlimited. People are always asking me, well, Dr. Shea, can you work with sinuses? Can you work with my toothache? Uh, can you work with my hammer toe? Who's doing the healing? If you're a spiritual healer, God's doing the work. So I said, look, take my name out of that, uh, that sentence and put God in that sentence. And now ask it again. Can God help your hammer toe? Can God work in your sinuses? Of course, the answer is obvious, yes. Now, it's been helpful for me, you know, it's amazing how spirit led me very gradual with very minor cases, minor cases, minor cases, because I wasn't very comfortable with this when I started. And gradually my faith started building. So gradually when my faith started getting stronger, then a person would come to see me with a stroke and I'd work with them. Uh, a lady in Grand Rapids came to see me with a stroke who couldn't talk. And I worked on her and she sits up and starts talking. Well, you know what happened at that stop. You know, she got on the phone and said, hey, I'm at the church. This is a healer here. You need to come here. <laughs> but it's a lot of people, when you say, oh, you're a healer, they go, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah I've seen a healer, yeah. <laughs> but until they see something dramatic, we've used the term so loosely that they don't expect a lot from it. Oh, yeah, my uh, foot re reflexologist, he's a healer. Yeah, there are lots of therapeutic healing. All spiritual healing is energy healing. Not all energy healing is spiritual healing. You can study an energy technique and not necessarily be a spiritual healer. But if you study an energy technique and you're also a spiritual healer, that's why two friends who study Reiki, one's getting great results and one's getting maybe so-so results. The one getting the great results is a spiritual healer who studied that technique. The technique doesn't necessarily make you have the gift. Uh, people have asked me, well, have you ever seen anything with AIDS? Well, when I was down in Key West, Florida 10 years ago, a lady had a T-cell count of 350 for five years, no change in five years. Two days after a healing, she went and had a blood work done, 770, back in the normal range. Very dramatic. She gave me all the documentation. Uh, tumors, uh, when I was in Atlanta, uh, and it's very hard to get documentation from medical doctors, but I was very glad to know that an oncologist had referred her to me. He actually had attended the workshop. So she had a massive tumor in her uterus, I worked with her. Six weeks later, she went back to the same oncologist. The tumor was completely gone. Another case I had good documentation for, a nurse, 48 years old, with degenerative disc disease, in a wheelchair for three years with metal braces on her legs. She showed me her lateral lumbar x-rays, which showed no disc spacing in the low back. 
So the vertebra were crushing the nerves going down the legs. She asked for healing. I worked with her. She started feeling so much better the following month. She had her low back re-X-rayed. The new X-ray showed disc spacing in the low back. Within six months, she was back at work as a nurse. It was a 99% recovery. Now, do I know that this is going to happen to everybody I see? No. You know, I don't have a clue who's going to have a slight response, who's going to have a dramatic response. And that's one reason, like I said, it's very humbling because you realize you're not in charge. Your role is just to make that connection. Uh, okay, so to get back to our list, another thing I want to share with you is what's called proxy healing. The first time I saw a proxy healing was at the ARE clinic in Phoenix. A lady was getting a massage for someone else. And I thought, that's really weird. <laughs> but then a man was doing a colonic for someone else. And I thought, no greater love. He who will do a colonic for someone else. So let me have number seven. No, we're not going to give you a colonic. <laughs> Let me get your name. Bill Greenwell. Bill Greenwell. Okay, let's have you in your stomach. Okay, to show you how proxy healing works, I need one of the first six to assist me on this next one. You want to assist? Okay, why don't you come on up. And your name again? Stuart. Stuart, okay, Stuart, why don't you just stand here? We'll say proxy by Stuart. Okay, so Bill, your spine, is it in? It's out, can I work with it? Okay, right leg is about a quarter of an inch shorter. Okay, Bill, I'm gonna have you stand up and I'm gonna have you hold on to your PPT, your personal paper towel. Okay. And you stand over here where Stuart is. Stuart, why don't you go get your shoes? Shoes? Shoes so we can do a measurement. Yeah, it was uh, the church in uh, Naples. They came up with, with calling that a PPT. Uh, I wasn't creative enough. So, uh, yeah, you can't measure bare feet. Bare feet are round, and if it's a slight difference, they look the same. Okay, I have you on your stomach. Okay, now with proxy work, for some reason, you don't have to say anything. Normally, I'm working with the person's conscious personality. With proxy work, it's the higher self. So you don't have to say anything. Okay, so Stuart, your spine, it's in line. Okay, Stuart, do we have your permission to be a proxy for Bill? That's a yes. I now brought your energy field superimposed onto him. Now I recheck him. The legs are uneven. Now I ask which vibration should I use to balance the spine? Is it the I am, the Christ, the Holy Spirit? It's usually with dense things, do it all. The name of the I am of the Father, name of the Christ, name of the Holy Spirit. Anything more done? Okay. Okay, ready to go back? Yep. Are you back? You're back. Okay, let's have you switch places again. Today, we'll have Bill with his personal paper towel. Okay, Bill, your spine. Anything more? Okay, looks good. Okay, Bill, you owe Stuart a hug. I'll get another one. Thank you. Okay, so why do a proxy healing? Well, the more direct we do healing, the best. In other words, one-on-one -on -one in person because of people's linear beliefs, belief system, they think God's more present. Uh, one church lady said her mom was very ill in Russia. She said, if I got my mom's permission, can I be a proxy for her? Yes, at least someone was in person. Next best, maybe one-on-one -on, -one on the phone, at least you're talking directly to them. Uh, maybe next best, I made a DVD for someone who said, but what if I need healing and it's the middle of the night? 
I know you're already asleep. And I said, well, look, let me, if I make it, I need, I gotta make certain that it works. So I had a lady who wanted the healing. I said, look, play this first. She did, she had back pain. One leg was an inch shorter. 20 minutes later, I checked her, her legs were even. She said most of the pain was gone. So it's not as direct, but I think maybe that might be the next way. Sometimes you can't do any of those things. One of the cases in the Little Book of Miracles, and I don't know if people got here the Little Book of Miracles, I know some of you did. There was a lady in Thailand, she got a cut on her leg, it got infected, gangrene set in. They wanted to amputate the leg. She had natives carry her to a village where there was a phone, called a friend in Florida. The friend in Florida then contacted me. They gave me, the woman gave me the woman's name in Thailand. She, they told me the problem. And for an address, all they could say was jungles of Thailand. That was permission and awareness. I worked on it within the week it was healed. So yeah, sometimes it's very complicated, but the best way to get a hold of me is call me rather than email me. I type with one finger. So email for me is real slow, but I check my phone messages every three or four hours, 356 days a year. Uh, so in other words, if it's complicated, like, well, the person doesn't speak English or they're in a coma, I'll figure it out. If the person doesn't have conscious awareness, then a family member can intercede to ask for the healing. So small child, person in a coma, person with Alzheimer's, or certain case of mental illness, then a family member can intercede. But if they have conscious awareness, they need to say it's okay. You need permission and awareness. Okay, uh, one year at Findhorn, we had about 250 people gathered on the lawn and someone said, thanks to the musicians for the great music. And someone else said, thanks to the cooks for the great food. And I had this inner feeling of saying, anybody wants their spine put in line with spiritual healing, step to the center of the circle. And all 250 people moved to the center. And I said, oh, great. You know, I just volunteered to work on 250 people the rest of the week. Then I had the thought, I wonder if I could work on the whole group as one. And I tuned in and asked, can I do that? And I got yes. So I gave them what I just called the Christ adjustment. Went around and I checked about 30 of them. Everybody I checked, the legs were even. A few days later, I had a dream in which a teacher said, you will be given all the help you need, even if it's thousands upon thousands of angels to assist. All you need is conscious participation. You gotta realize there's unlimited energy in spirit. If New York City would, would stand up and say 12 million people were ready, one neutral conduit could zap all 12 million people. Actually, another year at Finland, I was gonna do a group healing and one lady jumped up out of her chair and said, I don't want your healing. And I said, okay. Seems like she was a militant feminist who thought I was gonna give her some male energy. <laughs> I tried to tell her, no, it's the Christ energy. But what did I learn? You know, we always learn from these wonderful experiences life gives us. What I learned is spirit will not invade your space. If you're not receptive, spirit will go around you. So what I want to do with the last three is I'm going to check them one at a time, then zap them, recheck them, and then do a group healing. So let me have number eight. Do your own personal paper towel, and then let me get your name here. F-E-N-N. Oh, it's Sandy. S-A-N-D-Y? Yes. Okay, under your stomach. Okay, your spine is it in, it's out, gonna work with it. Okay, right leg about a quarter of an inch. Okay, Sandy, you can get back up, hold on to your personal paper towel. And you can just stand off to the side here. And then number nine. your name. A R. Okay. Understand. 
Okay, your spine, is it in, it's out? Can I work with it? Okay, right leg. Yeah, I think so far everybody's been the right legs. Uh, okay, right leg. Okay, you can get back up. I was giving a lecture, and you can hold on to your personal paper towel. I was giving a lecture in Amsterdam, and we had a heckler in the audience, and he kept on saying, well, what's the trick? How are you making those legs even? And I said, well, it's not a trick. Spirit works through me, balances the spine, usually the legs even out. But then after the next one, he said, what's the trick on that one? And I said, spirit's working through me, balance the spine, legs usually even out. And he kept on asking after every single person. Finally, someone got on the table whose leg difference is about two inches. I did the healing, and it slowly started getting even. And the person said, hey, you're not doing it. I said, that's what I've been trying to tell you. I'm not doing it. Be absolutely grounded in the fact that if you're doing spiritual healing, that it's not you. Because you can do healing by extending your own energy fields. But when you do that, you can get very burnt out. You can get drained. You can also get caught up with karmic things. When you stay neutral and let God do the work through you, not only do you not get drained, you get energized. I have more energy now at age 60 than I did 15 years ago at 45. So very, very important to stay neutral. Okay, number 10. Get your name. Jeff. Madsen, M A D S E N. M A D S E N? Right. Okay. Okay, on your stomach. Had an interesting case with a lady with an abscessed tooth. And uh, she said her dentist said she needed, you know, a root canal work and said, well, I can't afford it. She said, I know a healer. And the dentist said, yeah, right. So she called, I worked on her, she said all the symptoms went away. About a year later, she bites on the tooth and it cracks. She calls for some healing. And she said, this time it felt like I stuck a screwdriver in her mouth and was turning it. And she said, oh, the pain, stop, stop. And I said, okay, it's done. Next day, all the pain and all the symptoms were gone. Who manifested the screwdriver sensation? She did. She told me afterwards she had the thought that the nerve needed to be screwed out. You got to remember, spiritual healing cannot create a problem. It's just like prayer. It's like praying over someone and they say, well, I had a headache the next day. Well, you can't pray over someone and give them a headache. Maybe they had pressure and they weren't even aware of it, and maybe it made them aware of what was there, but it cannot create a problem. Okay, so Jeff... Your spine, is it in, it's out, can I work with it? Okay, right leg, about a quarter of an inch. Okay, you can get back up and hold on to your personal paper towel. Okay, so, you know, years back, I used to do expos occasionally, expos liked, you know, fancier things. I would have people go into opposite ends of the room and go, <laughs> you don't need to do that. You know, spirit knows where we're working on it and who. Okay, so I check on these three. Which vibration? Is it the I am, the Christ, the Holy Spirit? Do it all. Name of the I am, the Father. Name of the Christ. Name of the Holy Spirit. Done. Okay, let me have Sandy. Okay, your spine. Anything more? Okay, looks good. You can get back up. And if you're comfortable, you can give me a hug. Thank you. Can you take that? Okay, and I thought I'm with it. Zena. <laughs> I have a sister named Zena, but I know it's different. Zena. Okay. Okay. Your spine. Anything more? Okay. Looks good. You can get back up. Okay. Thanks. Can you take that?
and Jeff. Spine, anything more? Done. Okay, looks good. You can get back up. Okay, if you're comfortable, you give me a hug. Thank you. Let me take it. Let me also, do you know why we give hugs? Uh, I was speaking at a church in Birmingham. The minister first saw me in Charleston and then invited me to speak at his church. And he said, Saul, do you know why you we give hugs. And I said, well, I speak at a lot of New Thought churches and they hug a lot. And he said, no, I've been watching you. He said, first in Charleston and then in Birmingham. He said, when you've been doing the healing, you're getting very high with the Holy Spirit filling you up. You start leaving the body, which feels good to go out of the body. But while you're here, you're here to do work. And the hug grounded you back in the body. It's almost like the metaphysical explanation for the cross, heaven above, earth below, balance in between. We're spiritual beings having a physical experience and why we're here, we need to be in balance. Uh, I'm, gonna get, I'm gonna tell you about things that you can focus on for the group healing. In general, for the group healing, pick one thing. It can be something physical. It could be something a doctor said you have a problem with. It could be something emotional. It can be a relationship you'd like to have healed. Uh, it can be a financial healing, highest and the best for all concerned. You don't go into details. Uh, it could be a pet. You're in charge of your pet. So you can picture your pet and what the manifestation is. And it's just like someone said, oh, my dog, he was having digestive troubles. And I pictured him in the group healing. I went home. The next I realized he was eating normally. I've just seen dozens of examples of all these things, but I'm just trying to give you some example. But in general, for the group healing, pick one thing you'll receive more effectively. So I'm going to do that group healing now. Done. Spiritual healing is also very, very fast. You know, Catherine Kuhlman once said when she would pray over an audience, people would fall down, some wouldn't. Uh, she also said that uh, sometimes skeptics got healing more than believers because when a skeptic got healed, they became an evangelist. <laughs> so it's almost like my namesake, Saul, you know, Saul of Tarsus. I feel I'm making up from all my skeptical ways during my early days growing up in Brooklyn. And this is my penance now to tried to make up for all those days that I didn't believe anything. Uh, any case, uh, I said, I've tried to share a lot of different cases, but any example of healing that you might have a question of that maybe I haven't presented, you know, a lot of times in a, in a pre presentation, a certain amount of time, obviously you can't talk about everything. And when I say I mentioned on cases like the child with the birthmark, you know, I didn't say God removed the birthmark. I tuned in and asked what energy systems are involved like the skin, the organs, the immune system, the blood, the circulation, the spine, the nerves, the emotional body, the mental body, the spiritual centers, old memories in the astral body adversely affecting the present. Now, I didn't even know I could work on that until a few years ago. Someone said, can you work on that? And I said, well, I don't know. And they said, well, I ask. So it keeps on expanding. Uh, a while back, someone said, when you work on uh, pets, did you ever ask them who wants to have contact? And I thought, well, I never thought to ask that. Almost always dogs say yes. Almost always cats say no. <laughs> you keep on expanding. I'm sure if you stay here a thousand years, you would keep on expanding on what you know about healing. And we're all each other's teachers. Question in the back? Yeah, the question is, um, how about people that explain the existence, when someone says the body? Well, no one's ever asked me that question before. Could, could you repeat that question? Uh, what about people on the next plane? You said if they need healing. And my, th my thought is, I think we need to focus on what's in front of us right now. Uh, it would be my feeling on that. I think 
in another dimension, they have different things that work with them, different guides to work with them. And I think right now you could bless them, but focus on those around you that you can do something, you know, in particular. I think a lot of times we get immobilized doing things that's beyond our control. We get too caught up with maybe people are starving in other countries. What about the starving people in your own town? Start getting involved with things you can do rather than get yourself disempowered by things that are somewhat beyond your control. But good question. Lyme disease and the co-infections, have you worked with that? Lyme disease. Yeah, I've worked with that. Uh, see, when people come to me and say, oh, I have chronic fatigue syndrome, or I have a yeast infection, or I have Lyme disease, or cafe lay per Right. Physically, you don't. Right. You got to remember, everything that makes up that person can only be broken down into so many different energy systems. Organs, glands, nerves, muscles. I've never had a condition brought to me in 27 years that didn't fall into these different systems. And I ask, what can we do in terms of are they fully charged or not? And then I charge them. In other words, certain things that don't compute with the spiritual model is infection, cancer, uh, microorganisms, parasites. That's, these are the end result. In other words, if you charge the organs, parasites leave. If you charge the immune system, lymphatic system, infection leaves. If you charge the blood, AIDS can normalize or you know, uh, leukemia can normalize. You, you energize the energy system until it's working past its proper threshold level, it starts functioning. So it's not the medical model of how do we kill that infection or that parasite or whatever. It's how do we get that body to take charge of its environment? Um, I'm going to ask something very unusual. Sure. What about objects, buildings, or situations where there's problems with objects or structures or Say if it was the Leaning Tower of Pisa. I'm saying like any with car engines. I mean, if you were able to adjust the energies of objects, is that possible? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, I, I see this as a very unique group here. <laughs> uh, I've, I've never had that pose. I've, I've done, uh, they had, you know, entities in the house. And I had a dream many years ago that in time you will work with all things, but you won't seek it out. When it is right, it'll be brought to you. So one of the dreams in my dream book, I had a dream that someone had an entity and I led the entity back into the light. Up until then, I didn't know I could do that. <clears throat> the only things I've done with buildings, occasionally people say they think there's some entity in their house and it won't go away. Can I do some healing to get the entity away? Uh, to work on a structure, I always need someone to intercede to ask. So say someone said their building is unstable and they'd want me to do healing. I always realize you can't give God orders. So you have to phrase it in a way like that building, healing for it for the highest and best for all concerned. You can't say make it more stable or make it more upright because that's giving directions. But like I said, if you could put it in the terminology of healing, then I think you can do it. Very good question. Do you think Beethoven became a musician during his childhood? If you show a very high skill level and you didn't do it during your childhood, you didn't learn it, you obviously came in with it. And what I try to tell, look, we're all evolving spiritually. Don't be envious of another person doing something. We're all evolving at different things. And if you're doing something at a very high level, you came in with it. And obviously you just remembered it, you brought it back to the surface. So now if you're drawn to healing, it's probably something within you that resonates to it. And you initially, you don't know where you're at until you give it the possibility to unfold. I had not a clue that I was a spiritual healer 30 years ago. But because of curiosity and being guided from different things, I gradually gave it the space, the dreams helped and gradually it let me make decisions that let it blossom. Another person could very easily from fear have stifled it. But I think, you know, it's because it was already there. Just like 
I, uh, a lady asked for a healing for creativity in Dallas about 10 years ago. And the next time I was in Dallas, she came to show me these busts she did in clay. Beautiful. It could be a museum quality bust of, of heads. Of, it looked like, you know, Romans, and et cetera. She had never done artwork before. The healing released this thing within her. She, she had not a clue she had that. So I'm sure a lot of us have a lot of potential. Actually, what's the spiritual statement? You're so much more than you think you are. But yeah, if you do it something to a very high degree, you probably came in with it and you just re-remembered and brought it to the surface. The question there and then the question there. How do you step aside? How do we become neutral? Okay, that's a very good question. How do you step aside and stay neutral? And I think it's a practice just like prayer and meditation or studying one's dreams. The more you practice that neutrality. Now, for me, it was an intellectual decision. I realized that the healing was so much more than I knew that I said, I'm getting out of the way. I said, there's no, there's no way I know what's going on, so I'm going to move aside. But I've had lots of ministers say, how do you not get caught up with all the things people are bringing to you? You know, the, these emotional dramas, these tragic stories of illness and problems. And Olga Worrell once expressed it perfectly. She was the most famous spiritual healer of the 20th century. And she said, if you're a healer and someone comes to you for healing, it's like they're in a pit and you have a rope and you're outside the pit. If you get in the pit with them, you can't help anybody. So you got to stay grounded outside the pit and lower them the rope. But it, it's a good question. How do you do it? I, you know, some people it's harder than others. Some people you have to do certain procedures. Maybe say, the light of God surrounds me. The power of God protects me. Maybe say certain affirmations until it becomes your reality, maybe using sage to clear the space you're around, maybe doing just different gestures to clear the space and feel that you're neutral and say, you know, not, nothing that I do is part of me. I'm just here to help. It's just speaking to yourself until you can get your mind into that neutral framework. Whereas for me, like I said, this seemed to help me a lot and gradually it became more automatic. Now, of course, I still have cases that you know, I do this. It's, it's, it's become rarer and rarer. I had a case a couple years back uh, that I had to do that. A lady called and asked for relationship healing between her and her horse. Now, of course, I was on the phone. I went, <laughs> I said, okay, can we do that? And I, I got yes, so I did the relationship healing. It wasn't until a while later that I found out what had happened. The horse had thrown her and she had developed fear. And with the healing, she was able to ride the horse again. I thought they were dating and they were having <laughs> problems. And so I was just saying, oh, okay, can we do this? And, okay, so I don't, I don't know if that answers you, but the man? That was my question. That was your question, okay. About the horse. Cool. <laughs> question here. This may be too big for you to hand, uh, the time period, but how can you stay filled up? Can you fill this up with a treatment? Oh, okay. The question is, when you do the healing and you're filling up people's energy system, how can they stay filled up? Well, that's why, electron hol that's why electron holistic health. It's like I brought, you know, some of those CDs. It's called, if you want to learn about health, don't ask your doctor. But it's saying, do your part. Doctors can only help us with 10% of our health. Actually, health care is your care. It's not what doctors and nurses can do for you. It's what the 90% only you can do, which means eating right, staying active, doing some purification, thinking good thoughts about yourself, thinking good thoughts about others, having some quiet time and prayer time daily. That's how you can help maintain the charge and read positive affirmation books, books like The Impersonal Life. You know, just realize you are a child of God. God wants you to have the highest and best. It's like that statement Miriam Williams said, the thing we are most afraid of is not that we are limitless, not that we are limited, but that we are all powerful, capable of do doing all things. That's the thing we're most afraid of. See, for 13 years when I had my clinic, I kept on saying, God, leave me alone. You know, I'm satisfied. I have, you know, security. I have a nice clinic. It's a small town. We didn't come here as spiritual beings to get security. We came here to grow spiritually. But it can be a wonderful experience also. It doesn't have to be traumatic. But do your part. You know, if you do your part, the less someone has to do for you. And the more you do your part, the less you'll need to have these systems recharged. 
But a lot of times I see a person, they say, you know, I got healing for chronic fatigue syndrome. Six months went by, I felt great. I got into a fight at, <clears throat> at work. My boyfriend yelled at me. Uh, my dog bit my cat. And by the end of the day, I was feeling so drained I could barely get out of bed. What happened? The energy fields were lowered. In other words, when people tell me a lot of medical problems, medical systems can be very, very complicated. Just like arthritis, you know, they say, well, it's, it's age, it's this. There's so many medical problems, they really don't have a very logical answer other than it's, well, it's one of those things or it's aging. But I think the spiritual model explains it very easily in the sense that everything's energy. And you either do your part to keep the energy maintained or eat wrong or get stress or lack of exercise, it lowers the energy. And if it gets lowered to a certain point that you're getting manifestations, then you're manifesting arthritis or cancer or diabetes. But if you start taking care of yourself and a person changed their lifestyle, they start eating more foods that are alive, they get out of a stressful job, they get into a loving relationship, and all of a sudden they, get, they recover from the cancer and then come back. They're keeping their energy fields charged. So you know, that, that's the answer there. Okay, cleansing, it all depends. I mean, I think fasting for me is the easiest, one day a month. A raw food diet, one or two days at a time, is also very cleansing, and it's also very easy because you're still eating, you're still getting nutrients. So raw food like juice, raw fruit, raw greens, anything raw for 24 hours or longer is also cleansing to the body. Uh, Casey did say almost everybody could uh, benefit from an internal cleansing once or, or twice a year. So I think it's important. Probably just pick up any book on fasting. It'll be very motivating. Just I'll tell you about cases and what they had beforehand, what they experienced afterwards. Uh, even though I don't agree 100% with the book, I like the book, The Jesus Diet. Uh, it's a little booklet I came upon recently at one of the churches. They said they went to the, the Vatican and got archives on what did Jesus eat. And that was interesting. He was saying a lot of live food. He said dead food creates death in the body. So a lot of it was, once again, about live food. Don't get the body toxic, but he was using the terminology of the time. Uh, also, he talked a lot about fasting, you know, purify the body so the inside is just, you know, purified with water and with air. Uh, any other questions? Okay, uh, I always like to, you know, explain when people said, well, Dr. Shea, you shared your journey for so many years. Do you have any idea where it's heading? Well, three things seem to crisscross. One chapter of my book tells about uh, a symbolic football game being played. And old pros are coming back into the game, and I'm going to be the quarterback with these old pros. And the first time I had the dream, I was very excited because I took it to me, and this is a very important time in the history of planet Earth. Souls from all over the universe want to come to this dimension because this is the awakening of the Christ age. Uh, and somehow I was going to be a leader, a quarterback. And I've had about 30 dreams with this scenario. The second football dream said it was unusual to change quarterbacks once the game had started. But when the time was right, the sponsor of the game would bring me in. I like that, sponsor of the game. And I go out onto the field and I look down at my uniform and it said Phoenix. So I call it Team Phoenix. But it could also be the Phoenix symbol, from the ashes the new that will arise. And I'm looking at these old pros and I realize they had gotten sluggish. They had forgotten who they are. So point one, I'm to help souls remember who they are. Point two, the man I met at Fintorn in 81 and 82, what he told me in 82 was the muscle and joint work I was doing was not my life's work then. He said it was going to lead eventually to working with life streams, that which flow into the body and which the body flows into. And in this way, you'll help many souls find their way back home, point two. Point three, people are constantly bringing me books saying, what's the answer? And I'd say, well, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. And they'd bring me Bringers of the Dawn, the Ascension Handbook, ET 101, the Crystal Stairs. So one night at bedtime, I said, God, if there's something specific you have me tell people, let me know so I can then let them know. It was the only dream I ever had answered immediately. So I called it my Ascension dream because people were floating off the ground. So in the dream, I said, when you feel the raising of the vibrations, Release all cares about the, the physical body because that will lead to fear and loss. Go to the light and let go. And I repeated it three times. When you feel the raising of the vibrations, release all cares about the physical body, go to the light and let go. 
And I said it the third time in the dream, I floated up into the sky. Now, I think those three things interrelate. As much as I've enjoyed doing spiritual healing to help people physically, emotionally, mentally, with careers, finances, pets, but the thought that somehow to help people awaken so they could find their way back home seems like a wonderful task to undertake. Now, personally, I think that every one of us came here with a gift of spirit, you know, whether it's to teach, to lead, to heal. I know for me, I'm going to keep on walking on two worlds, and I'm going to keep on doing the spiritual healing. Uh, and I always like to finish with a dream. Uh, remember that if you do want to see me, I will be seeing people at Reverend Margaret's house. We'll give directions afterwards. But if you have a lot of things you want healing for, just pick your top three things. The simpler you describe it, the better. But then I'm going to check a lot of things automatically. Uh, so when I was in Peru, the shaman would get together us every morning and say, okay, who had a dream last night? And he'd look around the group, said, okay, anybody got a dream? Anybody got a dream? And then he'd say, okay, Saul, what was your dream? Because I was dreaming constantly. And he said, I was like the, the group dreamer. So that particular morning, I had two dreams, and I really didn't understand. And he said, okay, you had them back to back. You didn't understand them. Let's put them together. First dream, I'm in a church, and I'm eating a whole cherry pie. The message comes, the sermon is about to begin. And I say, no, I got to get out of here. I got to get out of here before the sermon begins. The second dream reminded me of the words of Dr. Martin Luther King. And I said, I've been to the mountaintop. And I've seen the glory, and I'm going back. If I can't run, I'll walk. If I can't walk, I'll crawl. But I've been to the mountaintop, and I've seen the glory, and I'm going back. So the shaman said, okay, you had them back to back. Let's put them together. First dream, you're in a church. The message comes. The sermon is about to begin. You say you got to get out of there. Why? Because you didn't want to get a piece of the sermon, just, I mean, a piece of spirit, just a sermon. You wanted the whole cherry pie. Why? Because you've been to the mountaintop and you've seen the fullness of spirit. Once you've seen the fullness of spirit, nothing less will do. You see, we've all been to the mountaintop. We've all seen the fullness of spirit. And for all of us, nothing less will do. And we're all going back. Thanks for coming.